started on their overview virtual lunch and learn of the CARES Act um, with the Paycheck Protection Program. So um, I will go ahead and mute myself. I will note that we are going to hold all questions until the end. So please um, hold all questions to the end and we will make sure that all of your questions get answered. All right. Caroline, can you hear me or hear me all right? Well, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is John Carpenter and uh, along with my partner, Megan Hutchinson, we're gonna spend a little time today talking about what's going on with uh, especially the Paycheck Protection Program as well as the other SBA program, uh, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. And Megan is gonna talk also about some of the uh, various uh, tax deferral and, and tax related programs that are that have been implemented through the CARES Act. And then we do wanna leave some time for questions. So let's start by talking about the program that has gotten, and I'm, I'm only gonna spend a few minutes on this, but the program that has gotten uh, less attention than paycheck protection, and that is this Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, and we'll refer to that as EIDL. And the first thing I'll say, which is not even part of the slides, but I think just from a practical standpoint, I will say this program administratively is not going well at all. Uh, this program is, is being run exclusively by the SBA, which means you cannot apply, do not even go to a bank to apply for this. The only way to apply is directly through SBA. They do have, a, they've had a website set up for, I'd say about a month now. Um, and for a while, the website was crashing every day. Uh, I, I think that's gotten better. Um, but the, the crush of applications has, has effectively crushed SBA. Uh, I just this morning saw a news headline from the Washington Post saying that even though the program says that that you can get emergency advances of $10,000 within three days of your application. Uh, SBA has come out publicly this morning and said that is not happening because they, they have just a crushing amount of crushing number of applications and not enough staff to process them. Um, I have anecdotally, we've had clients who applied for EIDL and apply and this uh, and, and applied for say a million dollar loan, and they've gotten uh, emails from SBA saying that they're approved. And guess what? You're approved for say twenty five thousand. So apparently they are in practicality, although they're approving loans, they may offer you substantially less than what you applied for. Um, <clears throat> So at the risk of, of being overly negative about this particular program, I, it's, I think it's just a practical word of caution that uh, this program is moving very slow. It is very underfunded, um, and I'm not sure I have confidence that it's go going to be funded much better than it is today. And, and, uh, and so definitely if for, for companies that are looking for money quickly, uh, this is probably not a great place to turn. With all that negative uh, uh, news to report, uh, you know, just in terms of the basic program itself, it is designed to help businesses impacted by COVID. Uh, and and you, know, you can go to the next slide. Uh, the the program is set up where uh, you know they, they are SBA is saying that applicant companies must have a credit history acceptable to SBA, that's not really defined, uh, that there has to be some source of repayment, that also is not really defined, and you and the business must be located in a disaster area. I believe now all 50 states have been declared COVID disasters, so there's no exclusion there. Certainly North Carolina definitely has, uh, so no exclusion there. Um, in theory, next slide again, in theory, you can get a loan up to $2 million. Um, in practicality, it does not seem to be working that way. And the, and the loan funds can, can be used for almost anything, uh, paying payroll, payables, other bills, things like that. Um, 
on the next slide, we highlight that under EIDL, uh, again, in theory, SBA is asking for collateral. <clears throat> uh, because this program is only being run by SBA as opposed to being run through banks, honestly, there's really very little visibility in term, uh, into the real practicalities of how they're administering. You know, if we know that they are asking for personal financial statements on the owners, we know they're asking for business financial statements, and we believe that if you get so far as to actually have someone look at it and perhaps approve it, that they are going to look for personal guarantees, they're going to look for personal collateral, but just very, very poor visibility into the practicalities of how this is all working. Um, real quickly on the next slide, you know, who can who can apply? Well, certainly the, uh, the the kinds of businesses that are in this organization are all eligible to apply. There are there's a few real estate property developers and things like that that are not eligible, uh, but but I think everybody in this group uh, can easily apply. And, and if, if we skip on to a couple slides later, you can see the website uh, where, where you can apply uh, through SBA. Let's skip on to Paycheck Protection, or PPP, which is the, uh, which is the program that has uh, that is better funded and we will probably continue to get better funding and has been generating lots and, and lots of questions from from many companies. And and I'll talk a little bit about uh, you know, how it's being evaluated, how it's being implemented and, uh, and, and who is eligible. So PPP, which got rolled out only about a week and a half ago, April, uh, Friday, April 3rd, was the first day that, in theory, uh, PPP loans uh, could be applied for. Uh, very different from EIDL, uh, PPP is being run through the banking system. Uh, there has been an SBA 7A program that's been in place for many years, and there are about 800 banks and non-bank lenders who are eligible to make 7A loans. And so I think wisely so, uh, Treasury and the SBA decided, let's use the existing network of seven, eight lenders to, uh, you know, to uh, disperse the $349 billion that was appropriated for PPP loans. Uh, the, the challenge in this program has been, even though the distribution channel through the banking network is way bigger, which is a good thing, uh, the crush of applications has also been unprecedented. Um, I, I, I'm, I am a former banker, and and I have a lot of contacts at at all the big national banks, and they all tell me that uh, that they are currently just hugely backlogged with applications. Uh, uh, one one banker was telling me yesterday that they currently have a backlog of 80,000 applications. Um, so be prepared for, for some delays in this program as well, although I, I think it's safe to say that loan proceeds here are going to be moving, I think, at a, at a much quicker pace uh, than they will in EIDL. So under PPP, in, and at the risk of repeating some of what you've already seen in the news, uh, but under PPP, eligibility very broad. You know, basically every company that was in operation on February 15th and had employees where you're paying salaries and payroll taxes and benefits is eligible. And um, and for those of you who may have seen the application form that SBA is using. There, there are certain reps and certs you have to make on the application. Uh, they're fairly general, uh, but included, you, you do need to certify that because of the economic uncertainty created by COVID, that you do need to loan proceeds to continue operations. Uh, and then there's other requirements. You can't be a convicted felon, and, uh, and you can't have been debarred from doing business with the U.S. government and some things like that but you can, otherwise, uh, you're eligible to apply. Um, on this slide, very last bullet, I'll draw your attention because we've had this question many, many times. 
Uh, what about if what if you use 1099 people? Uh, 1099ers are not included in how you calculate eligible payroll if your company is going to apply. And um, the window for those 1099ers to get their own loan, their window opened uh, this past Friday, April 10th. But but basically, if you have independent contractors on 1099s who, who do work for you, uh, you would not include any of what you pay them in your eligible payroll. Uh, you can tell them they can apply for their own PPP loan, and that is their avenue for, for getting some relief there. So on the next slide, or the next couple of slides, we'll talk about so who's eligible uh, for PPP money. Uh, basically, companies, I mean, the intent is companies that have no more than 500 employees are, are eligible. Um, I won't spend, we, we don't have much time here to go over the affiliation rules, but, but very importantly, if you are private equity owned, if you have private equity investors, if you have venture investors, if you just have some rich family and friends that are, that are investors or part owners in the business, then you are well served to pay close attention to the affiliation rules. And, and certainly Megan and I can answer questions later uh, or take emails on this, but, but we have had a lot of questions and issues come up where there are uh, venture or PE or family and friends, investors in a business, and, and you do have to give consideration to what other businesses those same investors are owners in or managers in, and are they considered affiliates of your company? That is a, that is a big deal. Um, there, are, uh, there are some carve-outs. Uh, if, if you have more than 500 employees, but you're in certain, uh, operate under certain NAICS codes, or especially if you're a manufacturer, you may get a higher limit uh, to that 500 employee threshold. And then on this slide, you can see uh, uh, fairly late breaking, uh, namely as of well, really just about a week ago, SBA issued this uh, as part of a Q&A document. They issued guidance saying that companies can qualify if they meet the two tests of an alternative size standard. And, and they're laid out here. It's this minimum tangible net worth, not more than 15 million in average that income after federal income tax for the last two full fiscal years of not more than five million. Still have to capture the affiliation rules. So again, if you are uh, if you are partly owned or, or or if you are owned and controlled through other investors, could be PE firm, VC firm, uh, then you have to look at whether other entities they control have to be grouped in for affiliation purposes. How uh, we can go on to the next one? How does uh, how does SBA count the number? How, how do you count your headcount to stay under that 500 limit? Well, it's it's every every person, whether full time, part time, or temporary, is counted as an employee. Uh, uh, again, 1099s are not counted, but but all the rest are. And then. How much are you eligible to borrow? Uh, it is it is two and a half times what is what is considered payroll costs, and payroll costs you see are really defined here. It's salaries, wages, commissions. I don't think we have anybody here on the line who has employees getting tips, uh, but salaries, wages, commissions, and an employer portion of typical group health care benefits like medical, dental, life insurance, employer contributions to any retirement benefits such as 401k, simple IRA, things like that. And then any, any state or local taxes that are considered compensation taxes. These are not state income taxes. In North Carolina, I, uh, Megan, you can maybe jump in if you're aware of any, but I'm not aware that North Carolina really has any pure compensation-based taxes that go on employees. So it's basically taking the sum of these numbers and 
and it's now clear from guidance that's been issued even since this program originated that that every applicant really has a choice you can take uh, these these numbers using calendar 2019 or a rolling 12 months that uh, that ended March 31 and frankly I would say if you're going to apply for PPP take the higher of the two uh, whatever whatever whether it's rolling 12 or calendar 19 I would take the higher of the two um, on the next slide a couple of exclusions to be aware of the biggest of which is any any employee who is paid over $100,000 per annum, you can only count the first 100000 in that base calculation. That doesn't mean people over, earning over 100000 are out of the calculation completely. It just means you can only count the first 100000 um, And if any of you have employees where the U.S. is not their primary place of residence, they are out of the calculation completely. Next slide. What can you use the money for if you are uh, when when you if you put in an application and you get to the point where you got your money? Well, what can you use it for? Uh, here it is. Those same payroll costs, which again do include benefits, uh, payment on any mortgage obligations which were in effect on February 15th. And here they're talking about commercial mortgages. They are not talking about the mortgage on your on your own personal residence. But if you happen to own the building that your business operates in, and mortgage interest is okay. Uh, more typically, rent. If you're renting space, that's that's an eligible use of the money. And any utilities is an eligible use of the money. And utilities does include the normal uh, heat and power. Also includes internet service as long as it was available beforehand. Um, things like that. Uh, on the next slide, you'll see here some of just the certifications that have to be made. Um, only one PPP loan per person, and and you are certifying that that, uh, that the documents that you may have already filed, be it your 2019 income tax return or just your typical uh, quarterly 940s, 941s, and W-2s are all accurate. The next slide, you see just a couple of little detail items. Uh, the loans are, uh, very importantly, no personal guarantees, non-recourse to the owners of the business, uh, no SBA fee, no collateral. And on the next slide, you'll see, you know, and we'll talk here in a second about loan forgiveness, but to the extent that any part of the loan you receive is not forgiven, <clears throat> then the balance of that loan uh, will be termed out over two years at 1% interest, no prepayment penalty, again, no collateral, no personal guarantee. Uh, all principal and interest is deferred for six months from the time you get the loan. Uh, so in general, we've, we have been saying to our clients, you know, hey, uh, whatever you can apply for, we recommend you apply for it. And we'll talk here in a second about the forgiveness part, but if you end up with some part of the balance that that is not forgiven, well, then take it, no problem. I mean, after all, two years unsecured, unguaranteed uh, capital at a 1% interest rate, either way, this is the best loan deal you are ever going to see in your life. So moving on, loan forgiveness. Uh, if, um, you know, if getting the money is the first step and a very important step, uh, what's better than getting uh, easy money from the government, well, the next best thing is getting most or all of it forgiven. Um, and this, and again, this may be the first time in history that there's a program coming from the government where not only can you borrow money on very favorable terms, but you can potentially get it all forgiven. <clears throat> and, and so in the forgiveness process, <laughs> there, uh, what SBA is telling us is that uh, once you get the money, in the eight-week period that starts on the day you get your money, you, you, you will want to keep track of these items, your payroll costs, again, including benefits, your payroll costs, the interest that you're paying on a commercial mortgage where the business operates, um, rent paid for the business office, 
and utilities. Um, you'll want to track that for eight weeks because the sum of that um, and noting that, uh, and I guess we don't have this on the slide, but one thing that was clarified since the program opened, um, under the forgiveness program, at least 75% of the forgiven amount must be expended on payroll and benefits. So uh, we've had questions where people have said, well, can I just get the money and, you know, I furloughed lots of my people, can I just use the money for, for rent and utilities? Uh, and the answer is no, or at least you're not going to get much forgiven if you do that. So, so the forgiveness amount, at least 75% of that has to be used for payroll and benefits, and the rest can be used for, for the items on other items on here. Um, if you go to the next slide here, talks about the, <clears throat> the type of evidence that is going to be required for the forgiveness amount. And they, <clears throat> at least based on current guidance, SBA is telling the banks that they are going to that you are going to actually have to submit copies of canceled checks, payment receipts, screenshots. You know, if you're sending an ACH payment to a vendor, um, you know, be it a utility or a landlord, uh, take a screenshot and and save that away. Uh, but they will, uh, all of this will have to be reported as part of the loan forgiveness process. And then on the next slide, um, you know, be aware that, and, and I won't go through this in, in too much detail, but just be aware your forgiveness amount can be reduced uh, to something below 100% if, the, if you re either reduce the number of FTEs that you have on payroll in that eight-week period after the loan closes, or if you reduce the uh, pay of FTEs by more than 25% during the eight-week period after loan disbursement. Um, you know, kind of the practical advice we've been giving to our clients is, you know, be very aware that, that your, your calculations for loan forgiveness do start the day you get the money. Um, if you have, or if you're in a situation where you've already had to furlough some people, um, either completely or maybe you've reduced their pay rates uh, because of impact from COVID. Our advice is once you get word from the bank that your loan's about to close, um, you know, our advice is take their pay back to where it was before. If you furloughed people, bring them back. Uh, if they don't want to come back, hire some replacement workers. Uh, there is no requirement that that, the, that you have to bring back the exact same people you furloughed. Replacement workers are fine. And during that eight-week forgiveness period, uh, frankly, there's no requirement that the workers actually work. Uh, we've had many, many, I mean, I know this, this group is, uh, is not full of restaurant operators, but we all know the situation that the restaurant industry is in. And we've had many questions from restaurant owners who said, well, we're closed because of public health order. We can't open. So if we're going to pay these people, what do they do? Well, the answer is, well, you can bring them in and have them clean empty tables if you want, or tell them to sit at home and play Fortnite. I mean, it, <laughs> there is no work, actual work requirement, but the requirement is you do have to pay them. And from a policy standpoint, I mean, the whole intent here is that, A, they want people getting paid regular paychecks and get them off the unemployment rolls, and more importantly, B, uh, they're looking for small businesses to, to keep those employees on payroll in the hopes that eight weeks from now, hopefully the, you know, the, the economy will at least be partially reopened, if not fully reopened. And, and for the small businesses that are being impacted, that workforce is then a ready workforce, and, and you can call them back to work you know, very quickly as opposed to having to rehire people off the sidelines. Um, so that is, I mean, that is just really an, an important feature of where, um, you know, where, where the, uh, the legislators on Capitol Hill wanted to direct this whole program. On the next slide, here's our, uh, 
we'll call it our unabashed commercial. We we are providing assistance to companies both on the front end of PPP to help them calculate how much they're eligible for, answer questions, help figure out uh, how much they can qualify for and borrow through a bank. And on the back end, although we haven't quite figured out how much work is going to go into this or how we're going to price it, but we will be offering uh, that back end assistance on the forgiveness step to companies who want to, to get our help figuring out what they need to pull together, how to present uh, the figures back to the bank, because uh, the forgiveness part will also be running through the banks. Uh, the same bank who grants you your PPP loan is the is the bank who's going to to grant your full or partial forgiveness. So, so that will take you uh, right back to the same lender. And with that, Megan, I'm going to turn this over to you. Thank you, John. Um, and Caroline, you can go to uh, the next slide there. So um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time highlighting some of the other CARES Act provisions, um, both from the business side and on uh, the individual side. And while the loan programs that John just spoke about are available to um, mostly small businesses and they look at the number of employees in terms of who's qualified, um, there are two relief measures that were part of the CARES Act that can generally be taken by all sizes of businesses. Uh, next slide, Caroline. The first I'm going to talk about is the employee retention credit. Um, so qualified employers can take a payroll credit equal to 50% of qualified wages paid between March 12th of this year and the end of the year. As you can see, um, there is a maximum credit that you can apply. Uh, and the qualified wages do include health care costs. This credit is not available if you have taken a PPP loan. So if you are a business that um, was over the 500 employees or you applied and you were, you were not granted a loan, uh, this would be a good avenue if you are continuing to pay employees uh, the whole, the whole uh, um, just of this is, you know, to keep employees around and to keep people paid. Um, and ultimately, this is going to be reported on your form uh, 941 e each quarter as you're reconciling. Um, so the credit offsets the employer portion of OASDI, your Social Security. Uh, next slide. Um, which is the Social Security 6.2% of wages up to 137,700 this year. So uh, the credit would be taken after you've applied any other payroll related credits. So um, if you're a startup that's taking advantage of the startup R&D credit, which is taken against payroll, you would apply that credit first before you would apply this retention credit. Um, so next. What makes you a qualified employer? Number of employees does not matter here. You must either have suspended or partially suspended your business due to the government orders. That does not mean that your business was deemed non-essential, um, just that you had some sort of suspension or partial suspension of your business. Or if you have gross receipts uh, during a quarter of 2020, that were less than 50% of gross receipts for the same quarter in 2019. If so, then you can claim credits for each quarter until your current year gross receipts reach reaches 80% of uh, prior year gross receipts. So North Carolina, given that we're under, we have a stay at home order, I, I would imagine that most businesses the second uh, bullet point there is a little bit more convoluted and looking at, okay, well, what my grocery receipts were, if you're pre revenue, then maybe you don't even have grocery receipts. But um, if, if your business was suspended or partially suspended, which I imagine most are given the circumstances of the time, then you would be a qualified employer for the credit. Uh, next, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but do know that how you determine how much your qualified wages are will differ uh, between businesses at the 100 employee mark. 
Uh, if you're less than 100 employees, though, it's pretty simple. You're just going to look at all wages paid during the qualified time. So all the wages that you paid during that suspension or partially suspension suspended time. Um, and, but that excludes any mandated FMLA or sick leave that, that you've paid. Um, next slide, we're going to skip. That'll tell you what your qualifying wages are if you have more than 100. The next piece uh, of this puzzle is the payroll tax deferral. This portion is a complete deferral of the employer share of the Social Security payments due um, between March 27th and the end of the year. Remember, the Social Security portion is the 6.2% on the wages up to 137,700. So you don't have to pay those deposits now. You track those deposit. You track your deposits on your 941, and those payments are deferred to the end of 2021 and 2022. You'll pay 50% uh, in each of those years. The important part to get off of this slide is that the deferral is not available if your PPP loan, once your PPP loan is forgiven. So while having a PPP loan excludes you from uh, taking the retention credit, a PPP loan by itself does not necessarily excuse you from deferral. Having the loan forgiven does. So you can't, so deposits prior to forgiveness can still be deferred until 21 and 22. Uh, and then once that forgiveness is granted, you're back on the hook for making sure those deposits are paid in timely. Uh, so given the I think John mentioned the, the eight week period and the, the time frame that you have to request forgiveness. There's a little bit more wiggle room there in terms of timing. Uh, so I do see some folks being able to take advantage of at least from a cash flow perspective, having some ease up here and uh, deferring that that deposit a little a little while, even if they're going to be forgiven on the PPP side. All right, next slide home stretch here. I'm going to chat just a little bit um, about personal income tax because there are definitely some some provisions in the CARES Act that are going to impact everybody from, from a personal standpoint, which I think is important to know. Um, the first of which is the much much talked about rebate payments, the economic stimulus payments. Uh, it was announced Monday that the first wave of direct deposits would be hitting bank accounts today, and they are. Um, he, uh, on Monday, was also announced there would be the ability to check online status and for you to provide direct deposit information if it's not already on file with the IRS. Uh, the link is here. That site is live. Um, and I did check it today and it does appear that the get my payment feature is live. So if you are once I kind of go over the nuts and bolts of this, if you believe you should be getting one of those payments and you have not gotten it, you can go online and check on that um, and give direct deposit information. So in a nutshell, individuals will receive 1200 or 2400 if you're a joint filer plus 500 for each qualifying child. Of course, there are income phase outs. You completely phase out of receiving uh, a payment if you reported AGI of 99,000 for single and 198,000 for married filing jointly on your last filed return. So, and in the from the qualifying qualifying child front, uh, children who are 17 and older do not qualify. So, the amount of cash that you get now is going to be based on your adjusted gross income from your last filed return. So from either 2018, or if you filed your 2019, it will be based on 19. Then next year, when you file your 2020 return, you will determine how much you should have gotten based on your 2020 AGI. So if 2020 calculates that you did not receive enough, you will get it with your 2020 return. 
if 2020 calculates that you got more than you should, congratulations, you win. Uh, there's no repayment of excess rebate. So if, uh, if, if the IRS is looking at your 2019 return and that AGI, let's say you're, you're married filing jointly and you're under the 150,000 for 2019 and you got the full 2,400, and come 2020, you made 200,000. No harm, no foul. You got the 2,400. It's not going to be included in taxable income. No repayment. It is what it is. You can skip the next slide. Uh, so, real quick, charitable contributions. These have usually only been claimed as an itemized deduction, which Many, especially now that the standard deduction has increased so much, don't utilize. Uh, in 2020, though, you will be able to deduct $300 in cash contributions without having to itemize. Uh, those are just cash contributions. So uh, non-cash donations to Goodwill are, are not going to fall into this bucket. But folks that are taking standard deductions do have the ability to, to get some benefit and an extra deduction in 2020. Um, just as a note, if you do itemize, charitable limits were also increased as well. And skip two. There we go. And then uh, last thing just to mention quickly is uh, just to be aware of certain CARES Act exceptions on early retirement distributions. Uh, so if, if you are in a situation where you're considering, is this a time where you know, special circumstances have come up and you need to take a loan against your retirement account. Uh, you need to take a distribution to help uh, kind of smooth the line to get you by. There are some relief measures in place uh, that have waived certain penalties uh, and also uh, spread the tax on the distribution over three years rather than all in one hit in 2020. You can skip over to, and that is all I have from the from the rest of the the care side. Um, we are, as John mentioned, from the PPP and just all things COVID nineteen guidance from a tax from a tax and a, and business perspective. You're staying very up to date. If you um, have questions, you want to check out any materials. Our website. Uh, there's a link here. We do have a, se a section uh, specifically geared for all guidance that has come out uh, thus far, as well as a section on uh, the SBA Paycheck Protection Program. So if you have questions, I encourage you to go to our website and check it out. Uh, we are also available. Our uh, contact information and emails are on the next slide, uh, which I assume the slide deck will be available after this presentation is over. Um, so with that, I think that's all really we have got to present and Caroline, I'll let you take over and I think we can open it up for questions. Thank you so much, Megan and John. Um, we just have a couple of questions. One was, will applying for the EIDL have a red flag and increase the chance of being audited? I, uh, if we're talking about like an IRS audit, I would I would say no. I don't think those two are. I, I don't think applic I don't think applying under either one of these programs is really going to impact the likelihood of audit. Um, I'll maybe you know as part of that question, I'll touch on this. I although I have not read the details on this, I. I did see a little news story, I think last week, <laughs> that uh, that announced that I think within the Treasury Department, but don't hold me to that, but somewhere in the government, they announced that they were standing up an office that was going to look into um, any any uh, uh, potential fraud in this program. You know, it it doesn't take a genius to to surmise that like any government program, you know, there surely there are companies out there who, who, who do not really need money that are going to apply anyway and, and take the forgiveness portion. 
Um, I think it's very unlikely the government is ever going to is really going to catch that before the money goes out the door. But I think it's also a sure thing that that the government will be doing audits of these programs after the fact for probably at least a couple years. And uh, and I'm sure we're all going to read about certain fraudulent events that will have occurred and companies that are going to get money that really did not need it. Uh, and I think we'll also read about the government uh, coming back and and uh, trying to reclaim that money and perhaps prosecuting people, et cetera. Thank you, John. Um, someone had a question that said, um, what's the story on needing an existing loan bank relationship to get the new loan? Great question. And and the uh, there there has been a lot of publicity and uh, and a lot of news stories about the availability of loans, and obviously this, you know, this part of it on the banking side is is certainly it changes by the day, often by the hour, um, and and is definitely different by the banks. Um, at a high level, keep in mind, you know, all the big all the big banks, you know, from J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Citibank, PNC, Truist slash BB&T, slash SunTrust, all of those large banks have set up online portals for applications, and that is the only place you can apply. To the best of my knowledge, none of those banks are going to accept a faxed application, an emailed application, or anything like that. It's portal or nothing at all. Because of the volume, uh, I do know that all of those large banks will, will only uh, process PPP applications if you're an existing customer. Um, I know that in the early days, uh, I'll just cite Bank of America early on came out and said, not only do you have to be a customer, but you also have to have an existing business loan or business credit card. If you only have deposit accounts at Bank of America, uh, initially they were not taking your application. I honestly don't know if that has changed or not. Um, but, but for sure, at the large banks, uh, if you they are not taking applications if you're not an existing customer. So where do you go? Uh, and right now, our best advice is you go to a community bank or you go to um, a non-bank. And there are some non-bank lenders out there who are approved to do PPP loans. <clears throat> um, and... And Caroline, we can, you know, perhaps a follow up. I can share a few names of some community banks, not not even necessarily in in the RDU area, uh, that are accepting applications. But but really, for for lack of any better guidance, I mean, honestly, for anybody who you know has called their bank and and you know, and I'll give you just for a, a for instance, and this is not meant to to pick on Truist, let's say, but. My understanding is that as of yesterday, uh, Truist even told current customers uh, that that for the time being their portal is shut down, and uh, and my understand they have a backlog of something like eighty thousand applications, <clears throat> and so until they can make some serious headway in that backlog, they're just not even taking any new applications, even if you're currently a Truist customer. So my my best advice is really, you know, kind of it's time for dialing for dollars. Uh, you know, just get on the phone or on the internet or on email and contact. I would I would go to the community banks because I think uh, they are dealing with smaller volumes. Now they don't have the technology to process large numbers of applications very quickly, but I think the best bet is to is to just be literally dialing around or getting on the internet and looking for anybody and everybody who will take an application from a new customer. Additional question, will unemployment insurance taxes count as forgivable payments during the eight week period after the PPP disbursement? No, un unemployment does not count. What counts are wages, commissions, uh, bonuses, and we've had the question about, oh, bonuses, so how big a bonus? Well, um, 
technically there's no guidance to say how big the bonus can be. Uh, I think uh, common sense would say keep it reasonable. Uh, I think it's perfectly reasonable if you bring, let's say you bring furloughed workers back and you want to give them a, you know, a few thousand dollar bonus each for, for coming back and, um, and helping to get the company stood back up. That's probably fine. Um, re remember that in the deferral period, that eligible payroll is still capped at 100,000 per employee figured on an annualized basis. So whatever that is, you know, 13,000 a month, no, no, less than that. Uh, so it's not like you can pay big bonuses to a few people and count that in the forgiveness amount. Small bonuses, okay, I, I'd be cautious about doing uh, large bonuses. And then the employer portion of typical uh, benefits are included in that forgiveness calc, but, but neither federal nor state unemployment is eligible. Um, another question, can funds be used for mortgage principal or only interest? And then what about payment of other prior existing debt? Only mortgage interest, not mortgage principal, um, and, and interest on other debts, uh, you know, any other lines of credit, other outstanding loans, no, those are those those interest payments are not eligible to be included. And we've had people question, you know, well, how about uh, you know, in order to get up to the forgiveness amount, if I'm if I'm a little bit short, uh, what if I prepay some utilities, maybe, you know, to get up to that 100%, you know, what if I prepay my, my Duke power bill for the next six months or prepay rent to my landlord? There is no, at this point, there's no uh, written guidance that says that that's, that that's either uh, permitted or forbidden. I think common sense says that and, and, and as further guidance comes out, I think we're expecting that that is not going to be permitted. Um, but we can't really, at this point, definitively say yay or nay whether that's whether that's a good idea or not. I think generally we'd say that's probably not a good idea. Um, a couple of people are asking if the slides will be available, and I do want to reiterate that yes, the slides will be made available on the Meetup page. Um, so I have a few more questions for John and Megan. Um, for the sole propriety, proprietor, excuse me, I didn't pay myself salary. What am I eligible for? We've had that question a lot, especially since Friday when the window opened for sole proprietors and 1099ers. Um, if you did not draw a, uh, it will, partly it depends on whether you have filed your 2019 tax return or not, but if you are, and it and partly depends on what kind of entity you operate under, but if, you, if you're if you a true sole proprietor, no LLC, no S-Corp, and you typically report your business income through a Schedule C, if you did not pay yourself any wages through a, um, through a W-2 or through self-employment income, then unfortunately you're not eligible for anything. Uh, if, if, for example, I know I had a question from someone the other day that said, well, I didn't pay myself any salary. Um, previously, I had loaned a lot of money to the business, and my income for 2019 was simply me repaying myself for that loan. What do I qualify for? Unfortunately, the answer is nothing. If, if you paid yourself exclusively through distributions out of an S-Corp, uh, then and you qualify for nothing. This program is really geared off of either W-2 wages or self-employment income, uh, which is kind of the bottom line net income reported on a Schedule C. Another question. Assuming one could take distributions without penalty prior to full retirement, is taking a non-penalty distribution larger, like $100,000, for example, affect those distributions? I'm sorry, can you repeat that question a little bit? You fit, went out a little bit. Sorry about that. Assuming one could take distributions without penalty prior to full retirement, is taking a non-penalty distribution larger amount, like $100,000, for example, 
affect those distributions? Affect the distributions that uh, come retirement, I assume. I mean, I'm not sure if I fully understand the question. Uh, that's the that's the full question. Um, we can get a follow up connection there for that one. Um, Mike, if you have a if you could do it. Oh, he said make must make in kind contributions. No, no, may. Making making the distribution does not uh, impact. You don't. You're not required to re recontribute that amount. Um, so if you're taking the distribute the non penalty distributions, um, you just have to factor that into your into your planning. And you know, if you certainly would be my recommendation. Um, if if it's if you can do a loan uh, or if you can recontribute that's definitely better um but you're, there's no requirement for you to do so um another question if an llc is registered to a home address may this individual use the loan for mortgage interest of that their house well uh Megan, maybe I'll start this answer, but I'll ask for your two cents on this too. I think uh, just from knowing the SBA regs, I think the best answer would be um, to the extent that that a taxpayer has a home office and they're used to taking a home office deduction. Um, and Megan, here's where I'll certainly want your input here too. Let's say, you know, and 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 for for individuals who do that they're probably used to in their tax reporting doing some calculation that says okay i i use this one of these one or two rooms in my house for my home office and that constitutes 20 percent of my living space and therefore i'm allocating 20 percent of my mortgage interest and 20 percent of my power bill and, and that kind of thing to my home office and that's my deduction then i think our reading of that is I don't think you can claim 100% of your mortgage interest, but I think you can claim the same percentage that you would use for home office. I, I, I definitely agree. Uh, not not 100%, but to the extent that, you know, that home that your LLC is registered to, to the extent that that home is your, you know, that's the business address, there's no other office, and you're using a portion of that home to conduct your business, it would be that that percentage, whatever that breakdown is, it's usually, you know, you look at the square footage kind of kind of deal and whatever whatever percentage of uh, the utilities and the interest that would be um, that would be OK, but it would certainly not be 100 percent. Thanks, Megan and John, um, and we'll just do a couple more questions. Um, one here, where is the guidance that states that full time and part time employees are counted the same? Um, it, it is, it is in the law and without, uh, <laughs> without going back to that, uh, Caroline, let me see if I can get you back to the right slide here. Uh, yeah, if you go to slide 14 and on this point, I'd, I'd, I do know for sure, and this is only in counting whether you're, uh, I mean, this only applies in terms of deciding whether you're under the 500 employee limit, but the law is specific. Uh, Full-time, part-time, and temporary are all counted um, in, in determining whether you're under the 500 employee limit. We have had I mean, here's here's one fine point that we've had this question thrown at us. What if you are what if you are someone who is used to using a temp agency, and um, and let's say over the course of 2019, on average you had 20 temps working in your business, but some week you know, but they weren't necessarily the same people. You know, in the month of January, you had these 20 temps, and then in February, they rolled off and the agency sent you 20 different temps. 
are you counting each of those temps as a position? Or literally, if you had 12 different people roll, rotate through the same one temp position, do you count that as one or do you count it as 12? <clears throat> I've not seen any guidance on that. My thinking would be, I think you count that as one. And, but I've, I've heard, I've read attorneys who strictly say, no, if you used a temp service and they literally sent you a hundred people in 2019 uh, to round out only 10 temp positions, then you'd need to count all hundred. Uh, but, but I think that's a gray area. And I would really count that as just number of positions. A follow-up question to that. Um, so that's only for eligible eligibility purposes, not for the purposes of the PPP forgiveness calculation of keeping 75% of your full-time employees. That's, that is correct because in the forgiveness side, your, and here we'll go back to Caroline, sorry to have to send you back and forth, uh, should be slide 24. Um, on the forgiveness side, that potential reduction of your forgiveness amount is based on an average number of FTEs, not number of people. So that that is a different method of, of counting headcount. Thank you so much, Sean. Um, we'll close out for questions. That is, a, we have reached the two o'clock time. Um, I will just leave this. Last slide up with Megan and John's information. Um, if you need help connecting them, then personally, please reach out to me as well. Um, and these slides will be posted on the meetup page and this session has been recorded and will be posted as well. So thank you so much, Megan and John for being here. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much for having us. We were glad to, glad to do it. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. Everybody have a great day. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye.